Matt Kelly. He, he works here as well. Right. Uh, Diane Bowden. Yeah, they're all working. Right. Right. Thank you for coming. I'd like to call the committee to order. So our first item of business is any public comment from any members of the public. I don't see anybody I don't recognize or know about. So we'll move on to the, actually, can we approve the summary of actions at this point? We have an, we don't have a quorum. What is our number for a quorum? Eight. You know, one shy. So does anybody have any corrections to be suggested to the uh, summary of actions? If not, we'll move on to the general business. People want to check their entries in the attendance log. Any corrections there? Review the uh, meeting calendar. We will, for, for the first quarter, be back, be back to our usual pattern of the uh, fourth Wednesday of the month. And people just want to check their entries in the uh, 2015 roster to see if there's any problem there. If not, we'll proceed to the first major discussion item, which is a presentation on BART's uh, progress on funding its infrastructure need and its priorities for the future. Unfortunately, Ms. Cronigan, the uh, general manager, is ill. So standing in for her is Ms. Rebecca Salzman. Ms. Salzman is the uh, director from District 3 which covers portions of Alameda and Contra Costa County, mainly on the far side of the hills, the uh, northern cities, and in the central portion of the county, the Lafayette, Moraga, Arinda area. So I'll turn it over to you and welcome. Thank you. Thank you for inviting Bart here tonight. Um, and we're happy to talk to you about what we're doing at BART, some of the challenges we're facing and the opportunities. Um, so I'm going to go through the presentation. It's a little bit lengthy, but I'll try to go through it quickly, and I'm happy to answer any questions that you might have. Um, so at BART right now, we're really focused on improving the system that we have. Um, it's an aging system, and our ridership has really been growing. So it's an exciting time. The Bay Area and Contra Costa really depend on us more now than ever, um, but it's also a bit of a challenging time. Um, so I don't know if you guys can see this, but uh, oh, you have it there. Great. Good. <laughs> Wanted to make sure you could see. So you can see a little bit here, but it's, it's a little bit fuzzy what the system looked like when we started in 1974 and what it looks like today. 
Um, so what you can see is there are many more lines today. There are many more stations. BART's over the past several decades expanded quite a bit, which has been great. It means more and more people have access to BART. But it also means we have more and more infrastructure to maintain. Um, so it's really been a changing system. And the ridership has just been skyrocketing, particularly recently. When I got on the board three years ago, it was an exciting time because we were just hitting about 400,000 riders per day. Um, and that was a big milestone. And now we're averaging about 430,000 riders per day. So that's just in three years. And a couple months ago, we had a month where we had over 440,000 riders per day. Um, so it's a good thing. It's keeping more cars off the road, making there be less traffic on the road than there would be. It's helping people save money on gas. It's helping reduce greenhouse gas emissions. But it's also a big impact on the BART system. So at BART, we've been doing a lot to try to make the system work better. And one of the things we focused on in the past couple decades is making sure the system is reliable. So you'll see on the reliability chart, what that's showing as the graph goes up is the time between major vehicle delays. And so there's been more time between the delays, which is great. And a lot of that has been due to the maintenance that's happening at our various maintenance facilities. Um, the work that's being done there is just really incredible considering our aging infrastructure, and they're doing a lot of preventative work on the cars and on the tracks to make sure things don't break down. Um, at the same time, we have the highest fare box recovery rate in the country, and what that means is a big portion of our operating budget comes from fare revenue. Um, so you can see on this chart, Muni at the bottom has a little over 20% fare box recovery, and BART is in the high 70s, approaching 80%. So we do quite well in funding our operations. The, the big challenge right now is the capital funding to reinvest. So as I mentioned before, BART's very important to Contra Costa County, and the busiest line, which I just rode over here, is the Pittsburgh Bay Point line. It was extremely crowded on the train I rode on, um, but it's, it's good. This is what people are depending on to get here. And as we flew by, I saw the traffic on the 24 and the 680, and it was stopped. So it was nice to be able to fly by all of that. So people really need it. Um, and 26% of BART trips either start or end in Contra Costa County, and about a third of the, the trip miles are in Contra Costa County. Um, so you can see here what traffic might look like without BART because BART is carrying almost as many people as the Caldecott Tunnel is carrying. Um, so if you imagine trying to jam that many poor people on the road, you can probably think about what it would look like since it's already very, very crowded. And it's similar um, on the Bay Bridge corridor. BART is actually carrying more people per hour during rush hour than the Bay Bridge is. And the Bay Bridge is at capacity, so it can't really carry any more people. All it's doing is the rush hour is becoming the rush, you know, many hours um, since there's no more capacity at those peak hours. Um, BART has also been really important in Contra Costa County for raising values um, and raising property values. And you can see this shows close to BART, um, values have gone up quite a bit, and further from BART, not as much. More and more people are wanting to live near transit. Um, so it's, it's a, a big thing for property values here and in the other counties as well. So BART's been focusing on a lot of our stations, improving those stations, and also a couple of extensions, including one here in Contra Costa County. Um, we're really trying to make this system work for today since it was built, you know, 40 years ago. So one um, big project that we're working on right now is the eBART project out to eastern Contra Costa County, and that's going to have stops, an extra, another stop in Pittsburgh and a stop in Antioch. Um, so that's being built right now, and a lot of the timing is, is based on the highway construction, um, but we're hoping, hoping to open it in 2018. Um, and it'll be a seamless transfer. It'll be similar to when you have to make a transfer from one BART line to another. So if you're at MacArthur Station and needing to transfer from a Richmond train to a Pittsburgh Bay Point train, 
it's going to be the same type of thing. You'll walk off the train and transfer to a, just a different train across the platform. It's different. Um, so that runs on a cable system, and I'll, I'll get to that in a minute. But this will be a different thing. But really, to the rider, it'll feel very similar. It'll be just like getting from one BART train to another. It'll just look slightly different. And this is just an image of the Pittsburgh Center Station. So in Richmond, we've done a lot of work on uh, the intermodal area around the station where the buses pull in and where there's drop-off and taxi and pedestrian zones. So there's been big improvements there and most of the work is done there. So that's been a big improvement for that station. Um, in El Cerrito del Norte, um, this project is starting next year. The planning has been completed and we're really going to completely change that station. Uh, it's a very, very crowded station. People from Contra Costa use it, but it's also kind of a regional station, so it gets extremely crowded. Um, and the station's quite small, so we're going to expand the station, add some more staircases and escalators, really make it easier to move around. Um, at Walnut Creek, we're in the planning phases for additional development. Some has already happened. Um, and this is something we're trying to do throughout the BART system is bring more development to our stations. And in Concord, as well as several other stations, we're planning bike stations because so many poor, more people want to take bikes to BART, and we want to facilitate that, but we'd prefer to have as few of them as possible bringing their bikes on the train. And what they've told us in surveys is they don't want to bring their bikes on the train either, but they need a secure place to park. So this bike station and some of the others we've built recently are really helping with that. Will this be uh, more more bike lockers, or uh, will it be uh, – I've seen mm -hmm. kind of a bike station where it's a large area where bikes can be racked up. This will be actually a, a separate bike station where you'll need a card to enter and exit. So we do have the lockers, and we're putting those in as rapidly as we can throughout the system because we just – can't keep up with the demand. There's so much of it. But this will be an actual station where you have to have a card to enter. You can go hang up your bike and then uh. come get it at the end of the day. So it's a, it's a way of um, having more bikes in a, a safe storage area than the lockers, which take up quite a bit of space. Thank you. No problem. Um, so, and we're also doing uh, wayfinding improvements throughout the system. And luckily here in Contra Costa, we have all of the stations funded and we're starting to do that. Um, we want to make it really easy for people um, when they get out of a BART station or when they come to a BART station to know exactly where they need to go, if they need to go to where the pickup zone is, if they need to catch a bus, if they need to find the local bike path. Um, to have very consistent signage so it's very clear for people visiting. And the other big improvement we've had recently is the BART connection to the Oakland Airport. That opened about a year ago, and we just hit our millionth rider um, right over Thanksgiving weekend. Um, it's a really fast, easy way to get to the airport. How many of you have ridden it? Great. Good. So I, I highly recommend it. It's an easy way to not have to go all the way out to San Francisco. There is an extra fee to that. Um, the bus before was $3, and this fare is $6. And we did that to try to recoup some of the debt we went in to fund the project. Um, luckily, it's doing quite well. I'm hopeful that, you know, in several years we can pay off the debt and maybe lower that fare. Um, so we've also made a lot of investments in earthquake safety uh, along the whole system and a lot of investments in Contra Costa. If you're a BART rider, you might have seen some of the construction going on over the past several years. Um, but we really wanted to – the first priority was to make everything completely safe in the case of a large earthquake. And then in our kind of major corridors to make it not just safe, but to make it so we could get it back up and running in the case of a major earthquake as rapidly as possible. Um, so we had a lot of savings in the construction costs, which actually allowed us to do more than the initial plans were when the bond first went to the ballot. So with all these great things we're doing at stations, they're really kind of <laughs> – 
Sorry to hear that. <laughs> um, we're, we're facing a lot of issues with our system aging. So I talked a little bit about what's, what's visible, um, but we have problems throughout the system that have to do with the aging infrastructure. And this is just an image to give you an idea. This is kind of where BART is at. Um, if you had a car that was, you know, 15, 20 years old, that would be kind of where BART is at right now, which a lot of our infrastructure is amazingly over 40 years old and, and still working. I recently went out to the track work between Fruitvale and Coliseum and saw the track there that was stamped 1968. Um, so it's kind of incredible that it's still functioning, but we're getting at the point we really need to repair and replace almost everything we have. Um, so we have the, our aging train car fleet, um, and we have the oldest fleet in the country. Um, and at the same time, we have this increasing ridership, so we're putting more and more of the cars into service. And right now, on a weekday morning, we have basically every car in service except the ones that are in maintenance or the few cars that are held in reserve for emergencies. Um, so these cars are getting a lot of use out of them, which is difficult when they're old and need maintenance. And then we have a lot of issues along the train tracks. So this is just one example of damaged speed signals. Those can cause a lot of problems, having to slow down the trains, cause a lot of delays. But it's really kind of these little infrastructure pieces throughout the system that add up to be quite a big issue that we need to address. So, oh, go ahead. There are 669 cars right now. Um, the, the vast majority of them around 600 or so a day. I really, it varies day to day because sometimes there are problems with cars um, or sometimes when we've had major weather events, we have a lot of cars go out of service so there'll be fewer one day. So if one day you see your train come and it's normally a 10 car train and it's eight that day, it might be because we have availability issues. So we're, but we're really striving to have as many out as we possibly can every day. Um, but in the longer term, we know we need to really reinvest. And the, one you've, the investment you've probably heard the most about is our new train cars, which we have ordered. Um, I wish they were coming yesterday, but they're, they're not quite there yet, but they're, they're coming very soon. Um, so we have 669 cars today. It's not enough. It means we can't always run 10-car trains on the lines we want to. Um, so our goal ultimately is to get to 1,000 cars. We don't yet have the funding for that, but we have ordered 775 cars. So that will allow us to increase our fleet, and we're going to right away when the new cars start coming in in 2017 operate a mixed fleet. So right away there will be more cars going out because um, we won't start retiring the old cars until we really have enough of the new cars. And there will be a lot of improvements in the new cars, uh, nice digital displays, uh, more room to move around. Each car will have three doors on each side instead of two, um, which will make it a lot easier to get on and off. It takes quite a bit of time in stations right now as the train operators have to wait for people to, to get on and off. Um, so that will speed it up and also help move people throughout the train because people tend to crowd near the door. So if we have another door, it will create a little bit more space. So that's very exciting, and that's in the works, and we have at least most of those ordered. How, ma how many seats are being compromised for the extra doors? It depends on the model because there are a couple different models depending if it's an end car or a middle car, um, but it's about a couple seats per car. We've managed to do that because we've made the seats slightly smaller. We had some of the widest seats of any transit system, definitely in the country, maybe in the world. Um, so we we did some we did a lot of outreach and had people actually test out seats and we got feedback that we could reduce them by a couple of inches. People would still feel pretty comfortable, and that gives a lot of space for people to move around and get those extra doors in. Um, so the other big project we have that will really allow us to use all of those train cars is getting a new train control system. So right now, even if we got 1,000 cars, we couldn't actually run all of them, and that is because our train control system is very old. It's very safe, it does a good job, but it has some constraints. So our current system, it sees everything in a block. So it knows that the train car is somewhere in this block, but it can't tell you if it's at this end or at this end. Um, so we have to run the trains pretty far apart to make sure that they're safe. 
So we are right now looking into getting a new train control system that will allow us to still operate safely but run the tra trains closer together. And right now we have about 24 trains going through the Transbay tube per hour in each direction, and this would allow us to get closer to 30 trains per hour. So if you're thinking those are each 10-car trains, and now all the trains are 10 instead of 8 or 9, that's a lot of additional capacity. So that's another top priority of ours. The third piece is the maintenance facilities. Um, and the, the big one that we're investing in is the Hayward Maintenance Facility. We're expanding it significantly, um, and a lot of that is actually being paid for by Santa Clara County because some of it will service the BART to San Jose extension. Um, so they're paying for almost half of it, um, and then BART is, through lots of funding sources, paying for the rest. But this will make it easier when the new train cars come in to get them out and running and then to keep them regularly serviced so we can make sure they're on the tracks as many days as they can be. And then the fourth piece is kind of all the little things I've been talking about. Um, it's all of our track pieces, it's our computer systems, there's a lot of infrastructure at BART. Um, so we have quite a bit of work to do there. So our total need right now is in the next 10 years is $9.6 billion. Um, the good news is that we have already programmed $4.8 billion of that. So we've identified that funding. We either have it or it is expected to come in. Um, we are considering going to the ballot in 2016 with a measure. We don't really have a number yet, but this is just one potential number that we're looking at is $3 billion. And then we're really looking locally to try to find the rest of the money. Um, unfortunately, there's been less and less transit funding coming from the federal and state governments. Luckily, the federal government, for the first time in many, many years, just passed a transportation bill, um, which has a little bit of increased funding, but it's really not kind of to the level that all the transit systems need because the estimated need for just the big transit agencies across the country is over $100 billion. So there, you know, a few more billion dollars they're adding is good, but it won't address the needs of all the systems. Uh -huh. I noticed there that you showed the original three counties only, and we've got a good time to talk about them. They are San Mateo and Santa Clara counties also contributing? Yeah, um, so as I mentioned, Santa Clara actually is contributing quite a bit because they're buying um, the train cars that are going to be run on their part of the system. So they're kind of paying for that. We, we learned a little bit from the mistakes that were made with San Mateo. So <laughs> San Mateo arguably should be putting in more money, and the agreement, you know, wasn't so favorable to BART. So BART really learned from that extension and created a much different agreement with Santa Clara County. So they're really paying for the full cost of not just their extension, but the impact. So they're paying for train cars. They're paying for a big share of expanding the Hayward maintenance facility. So they're, they're doing quite a bit. So in that identified funds, the $4.8 billion that we've identified, part of that is from Santa Clara. I couldn't tell you the exact number off the top of my head, but it's a significant portion. Um, so this just shows the, uh, the 20, 2004 Measure J in Contra Costa. The BART share was $190 million. Um, measure BB in Alameda County, which just passed, uh, had a larger BART share. And I can tell you the former Measure B in Alameda County, it was lower than this, but the, the current one has $865 million. So we're really trying to go to all of the counties and ask for support, and we're trying to get similar support from San Francisco as well. So if we do all of the things that I've talked about, we're going to have a lot of benefits, not just for BART, but for Contra Costa and for the whole region. We'll reduce traffic. We'll reduce greenhouse gas emissions and improve air quality. We'll really help the economy because so much of the economy right now is dependent on BART. And if we don't make these investments, we're going to have a lot more of the crowded traffic that we already see today. Um, this just shows, um, and this study was done a while ago, so I think all of these bars would be a lot higher if it was done today. But the, the blue line shows you what the traffic is right now um, on those highways, um, and the orange line shows what it would be projected to be without BART. 
Um, so you, you've seen how bad the traffic is today. You can kind of imagine the levels of magnitude higher it would be without BART. Um, so I'd love to hear about your priorities for BART and would love to hear if you have any questions. I have a couple questions, but I'll start off with one. When you mentioned you were spending, uh, I forgot what you said, on earthquake safety. How much was that? Three billion. Three billion? Yeah. And uh, for the earthquake safe, what does that mean? The, there's, I mean, uh, is it good enough for a 9.0? You know, it's it's different on each segment of the trackway. Right. I, I'm not sure I could tell you all of the details, but the goal was to make it at least s safe for people, so to get to kind of the life safety level for a very large earthquake. And a lot of it's going to be dependent on where that earthquake is centered. So if you're on a BART track and you're at the epicenter, it's going to be very different than if the epicenter is, you know, 50 miles away. So there's projections and we think we're at kind of the best level we can be at for life safety. And then we have upgraded a significant portion of the system. So it's not just at life safety, but not necessarily would be, you know, up and running in a few hours, but maybe in a few days or a few weeks instead of getting into a situation where we have many years that we need to repair it. Is there a, a on your website, a place where we can go to find the information to cover that? There is, and I'd be happy to share with your staff, too, the link and some more information about that it. That would be good. If no one else has another question, I got another one. This is for a very tiny, tiny group of people um, uh, that ha it has something to do with the ADA requirements and the uh, EPA MDs, the Electric Personal Assisted Mobility Devices. Um, I have permit number one, uh, and I was helpful in, in getting them to, uh, uh, or helping them write their safety program. At any rate, there was a group of people that benefit from being able, because of their disabilities, being able to ride on the platform. Has BART changed the policy of no riding on the platform for them? I'm not sure I know what devices you're... What Segway. do they look like? Okay. Segway. No, we haven't, um, but that's something we could consider. Okay. Uh, yeah, it, hasn't, it hasn't come up <clears throat> since I've been on the board. It, might, it may have come up before I was very, on the board. Very, very small group of people, but they, they, they have disabilities that uh, restrict them from walking, mm -hmm. and there is some pain involved when they do walk, and they use the, the Segways as a mobility device to mm -hmm. get around. Otherwise, they'd have to be in, in uh, uh, wheelchairs, for which some that's uh, okay. not doable. Well, I'd be happy to talk to you about it more. It's not an issue I had heard about, but I'd be happy to look into it. Thank you. Yeah, I have a question. Go ahead. About the, um, uh, the cost of the uh, cars on order, how many cars have been ordered, and what company is it, where, where? So we've ordered 775. Our ultimate goal is 1,000, but we need to identify the funding for the rest of it. Um, the company is Bombardier. Um, unfortunately, there are no American companies that make these train cars. None of them bid. We would have loved to have it be a fully American company, but we couldn't get that. But since uh, some of the funding is federal, there are Buy America requirements. So a majority of the work on the cars is happening in the United States. And I can actually get you the full breakdown of where all of the stuff is happening. But there's a facility out in New York, and there are several other facilities. So the work is being done here. So at least people in this country are, are getting jobs from the project. Mm -hmm. And I, I was also curious about the cost of each car. I have to pull that up. But that's what I thought. It's three point something million, but I can't tell you what the point is off the top of my head. Okay. Well, expect to pay a prime rate for a good limousine. <laughs> yeah, I mean, and the, the, the reality is with the BART system, it was built um, not in the same way that all the other subway systems were built. So we have to order everything specialized for BART. Um, so we can't really get anything off the shelf. So that's an unfortunate thing. That it was a decision made a long time ago. The good news is some of our 
newer systems we're doing, like the Oakland Airport connector and the eBART extension, they are more off-the-shelf items. So to replace some of those things in the future, it'll be hopefully a little bit cheaper. Thank you very much. Rebecca, I'm just curious. Um, are there any long-term plans to look at uh, two of the most expensive pieces of real estate in the BART system, the Arinda and Lafayette stations, and looking at uh, perhaps making parking a bit more efficient instead of having just those huge surface lots, which unfortunately are usually full by 7 or 7.15 every weekday? I'm, I'm just curious if that's something in the long-term plans. Yeah, I mean, I think – in the, sh the shorter term, we're looking at a lot of what we can do to improve access to our stations because it's not just at those stations, but it's at almost every single station. The lots fill up quite early. Some earlier than others, it's more like 7 a.m., some it's 8 a.m., but they're all filling up. And so we're trying to figure out how to address this, partnering with other local transit agencies, improving access for biking and walking so the people who can do that will do that and free up spaces for cars. But we're also kind of trying to get more creative and look into some other options. We've been in discussion with um, companies like Lyft to find out what they could do, some special services they could do, not funded by BART, but things they could offer to BART riders to get people to the stations. So we're looking at all options on the table. And if you have ideas, we'd love to hear them because we know it's a very, very big problem. Um, in terms of building more parking at stations, we don't, although we own the land, we don't control the zoning of the land, so it's really dependent on the cities. So if a city decides they want bar parking structures or development on the land, that's something we can work on and try to identify funding. But some of, I know some of the cities have not wanted to build parking structures, so that's been somewhat of a challenge. And BART doesn't really fully have control over that, so it's a little bit of a give and take. Another question for you. With the uh, push on by California and the state and local municipalities to electrify California, is, is BART or does BART have a plan to install or provide electric charging stations? So we are actually exploring that right now for our station that's being built and will open in a few months at Warm Springs. Um, <clears throat> it's easier to do with the newer stations because to lay the infrastructures is a lot easier. Um, so we're looking into testing it out there to seeing how it works out. We want to make sure that it works out in the way we intend it to um, because we do have the parking shortages at stations. We don't want to make it it's only if you can afford an electric car can you have these parking spaces. So we're kind of looking into it and the, the problems it can bring as well, but it's something we're interested in, um, and I think we're going to test it out there and then see how it works and think about bringing it to other stations. On your project to reduce headways, that's mainly fixed infrastructure improvements as opposed to onboard car control improvements? Yeah, it has to do with the train control system, which is kind of a computer system, but also communications at the, the track levels that then communicate back with the cars. But it's, yeah, it's operated through the, the track and the computer, not through the individual cars. So it's not, it's not conditioned <coughs> on just running new cars in the fleet. It will work with the existing cars as well. It could. Um, likely by the time we have it installed, we'll have mostly the new cars, um, just in terms of the timeline, because right now we're just starting the study phase and putting it out to bid just for somebody to bring the idea. So probably the timing will work out, so we'll have the new cars and the train control system. Okay. <clears throat> I can't let you go without talking about funding uh, plans for next year, mm -hmm. because, of course, CCTA has its plans, um, I'm where the city is looking to try to, you know, float another measure to bring more funds in for, you know, for local streets. Mm -hmm. So how can we all work together in such a way that we can, you know, hopefully ensure the passage of all these measures uh, rather than having, um, you know, voters slash taxpayers kind of throw up their hands and say, how do we do this? What do you think? 
I think we're very interested in working together. I think a lot of the localities within BART's district are running various measures, whether it's for their streets and roads or whether it's a, a county measure. I think it's going to be a really crowded ballot altogether, including at the statewide level. I mean, it might be pages and pages before people get down to the regional measures. So I think we'll need to, you know, work together and make sure to partner and try to get the message out there that all of this is important. Any further questions from the committee? I, I have one more um, to uh, bring EBAR up. Uh, you're taking at least a year of system testing before you go into revenue service? Well, a lot of the testing gets done in parallel with the construction. Um, unfortunately, some of the timing has been put off because of the highway construction. So a lot of our extensions aren't dependent on highway construction. So we can move forward, do construction at the same time as system testing. That's what's been happening with Warm Springs. So the station isn't fully done. They're doing all the testing at the same time. We don't have as, as much leeway, and if you need more details, I think Karen could probably tell you a little bit more. That's I, I do know about EBAR, but Director Keller represents that area, mm -hmm. so he's been more involved in all of the details. But I know that's that's been the main frustration with the timing. Well, I live out in Broadway. I'm well aware of what's happening in the construction out there. But we do, we want to make sure it's safe. I mean, that is yeah. the priority number one, is that it's safe, that it's going to be reliable. There's no sense in starting to operate something and having to shut it down a week later. The last I heard into the recent few weeks was revenue service in 2017. So I was a little surprised that it slipped again to 2018. This is what we're hearing most recently, mm -hmm. and again, a lot of it has to do with the Highway 4 construction. Yeah. So we're, we are as eager as you are to get it out there and get it running, um, and we'll get it going as quickly as we can. For the information of the committee, one thing we have been able to do, I guess in conjunction with BART, is get on the 25-year uh, planning calendar of MTC for initially a uh, park and ride lot at where we think the next BART station on eBART would be, which would be called the McQualamy uh, Station, that area just uh, south of Lone Tree Boulevard by a few hundred yards. So starting at that on the long term, certainly unfunded, and Lord knows when the funding would take place, but we we're already looking at a station in Brentwood the possibility of eventually having a station in Brentwood. Of course, the mayor and I are both wondering whether we'll be alive to see it, but. <laughs> <laughs> well, if there are no further questions, I can thank you very much. Thank you. And it's been highly informative. Yeah, we're all, I know, I'm looking at a uh, special district urgent funding measure that we may have to get on in November of 2016, and we're all aware it's going to be an intensely crowded ballot, which is a little scary. But thank you much, so much for so ably uh, stepping in for your general manager. I hope she heals up quickly. Thanks. We now have a quorum, so I would like to drop back to the approval of the summary of actions. Move approval. Second. Do I have a second? Second. Second. Thank you. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Any abstentions? Okay. We will proceed on to uh, item 2.2, discuss the proposed change to the uh, Measure J calendar year growth management program compliance checklist. Thank you, Chair Smith. Uh, Matt Kelly, uh, Contra Costa Transportation Authority staff. Um, so tonight uh, we are, we're bringing to you the uh, 
most recent uh, growth management program compliance checklist. Uh, this would cover the fiscal year 2015-16 and 2016-17 um, cycles. We, in last July, uh, as you probably remember, our last meeting uh, completed the uh, 12, uh, uh, calendar year 12 and 2012 and 2013 uh, checklists. Um, so this time around, um, we are bringing this to you with one change to the checklist. Um, as I'll just give you a brief refresher on what the checklist is. I, I know most of you know, but some of you are newer. Um, each uh, jurisdiction, including the county, um, at, for each uh, year submits a checklist that, you know, uh, where they, uh, where they uh, confirm that they have met all the requirements of the growth management program. And um, this time around we are, and by submitting that checklist and it being complete, they get their 18% return to source funds from Measure J, which is uh, for their local streets and roads maintenance. Um, so this time around, we are bringing it back to you. It looks exactly the same as, as la the last checklist you've seen with one uh, change, one addition. Um, there, is, there is a report that the cities are asked to submit um, each uh, calendar year, and it's basically an audit of their local streets and roads maintenance uh, expenditures for the year. And it's, a, it's how the authority really gets a grasp on what is spent and what it was spent on, purely Measure J money. Um, we like to be able to go out and, you know, our, our elected officials and our, uh, and our staff, you know, would like to be able to go out and say, you know, uh, this year $12 million of Measure J was spent on pothole repair. Uh, $15 million was spent on adding new bike lanes. Those are just numbers off the top of my head. Um, you know, things like that. So it's, this audit is a really good way of, of measuring the, the uh, impact of Measure J on our local communities. However, that report isn't mandatory right now, um, and we don't get, we don't always get a complete uh, reporting from all the cities. We get, you know, a complete report from a few cities, a partial report from some cities, and barely anything from other cities. So what we're proposing this time around for the next uh, two, or for the next uh, checklist cycle is to add um, the uh, LSM audit report as a requirement to the GMP checklist. And if you look on uh, page 2.2-4 of, of your uh, agenda or page 4 or 5 of, of this item, uh, you'll see what we're proposing to add to the checklist. It's about uh, two-thirds of the way down the page. Submittal of LSM reporting form. And the question would be, has the local jurisdiction submitted a local street maintenance and reporting form for eligible expenditures of 18% funds covering fiscal year 12-13 and fiscal year 13-14? Um, so that that would be the question. Um, we, in your packet, you can also see what the report, the current report looks like. It's on page 2.2-17. Uh, and the previous page is a, is a, uh, a memo from Martin Engelman when we send this out to the locals. And we usually send it out in December and ask for a response by the end of January. Sorry, we send it out in November and ask for a response by the end of the calendar year. Um, so uh, here's the form right here. It's pretty basic. And then we also, uh, we ask for the expenditures to be listed on the front page. Um, we provide, on the next page, 2.2-18, we provide a list of, um, of sample uh, expenditures and and. Uh, project descriptions because in addition to the money, we also ask for them to kind of expand upon on just the dollar amount and provide us with some 
concrete examples of what they've uh, they've spent their money on. And so this, we, we feel if, if they're reporting the money as well as a description of what is actually spent on, that'll give us a much better, uh, you know, a much better picture of, of how the money is being spent. Um, in the meantime, staff is actually working on a kind of a better reporting system. This table, the way, it, or this reporting form, the way it is, is, you know, people can kind of put whatever they want in there and we're, we're going to come up with internally a, a more um, an easier to fill in report, maybe with some drop downs so people aren't having to, or there's a more consistent reporting uh, methodology as opposed to just whatever you want to write down. Um, so we're working on that uh, kind of in the meantime, but for now um, we'd like to uh, distribute the uh, the fiscal year 2015-16 and fiscal year 2016-17 um, checklist with this addition and uh, we'd like to distribute that to the cities uh, for their comment. We took it to the planning committee last week. We'll be taking it to our technical coordinating committee next week as well as the authority for their first look at it. But we're also looking for your comments since uh, this is a, uh, this will be part of the checklist that you have to review. So um, we'd like to have an open discussion and any questions you have of staff. Matt, uh, I was reading this uh, and it immediately struck me, uh, is I want to reiterate what you said. If we ask the cities to do this, they might do it, they may not do it, they may ignore it, and here we sit. So I looked at the wording and said local jurisdiction, jurisdictions are asked. I'd like to change that. They're required. Well, and, and by making this uh, a checklist item, it would. And, and that would be my next comment. So if they're not required, why is it on the checklist? Well, it's not. They could, I know, but why add it? They could ignore it. And rather than having that and undermining the checklist's uh, uh, integrity, I would, I would ri rather have them required to complete it. Now, when you say uh, that we ask them to, where? where well, 2.2-2, where it says action plans, toward the bottom, local jurisdictions oh. are asked. Rather than ask, they're required. Yeah, and, and right above it, it says the requirements of this checklist. Exactly. So, yeah, I, I think the word ask should probably be switched to required um, because anything that's on the checklist basically becomes a requirement unless you don't want your 18 percent. Correct. Correct. And, and I think most cities do. And just to add to that, um, the NA, not a, it's either yes or no, right, in most cases, but I see a lot, a lot of areas where there's yes and no but then there's other areas that have NA. But if it's no, I mean, that's an opportunity for someone or a jurisdiction to explain, right? Yes. It, generally, so, if, if there's a no, um, they, they do have to explain why, why it depends on the item, but yes. So at any time, would there be a not applicable? Like if there was a jurisdiction that said, say they don't have any bike trails, I don't know, and they say, okay, no, we don't have any bike, bike trails. Right, instead of NA, we don't have any bike trails. We won't. <laughs> it seems a little kind of like, well, it's a yes or no, right? Yeah, and for this for this edition of the the LSM audit report, um, you know, it, it would seem that it would be a yes or no answer because they're unless they didn't receive their 18 percent um, return to source funds. Um, unless they didn't receive it or didn't spend a dime, and I. I doubt many are, are doing that. So that's something I'll um, yeah, we can discuss. But going to be, would, is there any for really practically foreseeable case where an NA would be a response? Yeah, I'm 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 trying to think of examples. I, I don't think anybody fails to spend their money. Uh, yeah, unless they and were I, out of compliance. And I don't and, there was a near run issue a few years ago, but I don't think anybody has ever failed. Right. Eventually qualify for their 18%. Right. And no one's never 
not gotten it if if they were out of compliance once they get back into compliance then they're right. once again eligible to receive their, okay, okay. their fund. I have two other comments uh, and the other you have mentioned the drop down option so the cities would have a an easier methodology of completing the forms and there would be a drop down uh, are you offering them not only a particular or or populating the particular uh, file for a specific response, but are you also offering other, and with other, they would then have to explain. Mm -hmm. Okay, and then my, my last one is that you had asked us uh, to look at where we would suggest in placing this uh, addition to the form, and stated at it, at it next, at the end of the checklist, and I was looking at the checklist, and I would like to have us consider adding it after number four. So it would be the new number five. So in between traffic, traffic impact, impact studies, studies and participation in cooperative multi-jurisdictional multi planning. I think that it would just follow suit after the traffic impact studies to look at the, uh, the streets. Okay, yeah, I don't, I don't think um, there's any requirement that we put a new checklist item at the end, so thank you for that suggestion. I have a question yes. for you. Mine is uh, a little bit different. Um, first, I wanted to, I wanted to ask, uh, what happens when people come before this body and, like you say, we review um, the, the reports and, uh, or the checklist? and they're not in compliance when they show up here. And if you question, for an example, uh, we talked to folks about uh, the employment opportunities that come through certain areas that are in dire need for, for uh, employment and things of that nature. And they don't have a report. And there's no follow-up. Um, yet, uh, when I go to city council meetings, they've received money from the, the transit so, yeah, I, I mean, how I, is that going to be different? You know, in, unless it's an actual requirement on the checklist, we can't withhold funds. And and I, I remember the, the discussion we had at that meeting where you were inquiring about, you know, uh, you know, expanding job opportunities in certain locations. And that is a function of a, a city, but that's not a requirement we put on them. So technically, you know, they, they should follow up and answer your question, but that's not a, a, a CCTA requirement that they provide, you know, oppor uh, employment opportunities. Um, we certainly encourage that, and, and we as an authority are trying to do that in our various uh, efforts, including the GoMentum station out at the, the Naval Weapons Station. But um, in terms of requiring cities to do that, that is not a current requirement on our checklist. I guess the reason it, it, it kind of confused me is that I, I, I can't remember exactly where I read it, but I read something that if there's a expansion, that uh, there should be some uh, local opportunity economically. And I, I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm still pretty new at this, mm -hmm. but I've, I've seen uh, on the checklist, so those checklists are not provided by us, or is it a joint checklist? Because well, we issue the checklist to the city. They fill it out, and then um, and then we uh, present that to you for your review. Um, but before we present it to you, we've we've kind of looked at it and made sure that they are, you know, for the most part in compliance. If if a city appears to be out of compliance on any one issue, we will, you know, we will contact them and say, hey, you've submitted your checklist, but you know, you didn't, uh, you know. You didn't. We know you did a traffic impact study, and you've said, you know, no, um, or something to that effect. Um, so we try and work those things out before it gets to you. Um, but you know, I, I think our Director Iwasaki would like to comment on, you know, putting locals to work. Is that is that what you were here? Well, well, well let me let me say this. You did you did answer my question. Okay. And by let me know that that uh, that is not something that's put on by the Transportation Authority. Right. I certainly understand that. So my follow-up would be, 
how do we make it part of uh, um, the transportation authority? If, if we're investing money in housing, uh, we're talking about there are discussions going on, I, I believe currently, talking about how to, um, you know, come in and help rebuild uh, uh, a certain area of Antioch. And uh, that's all local opportunity. Mm -hmm. But if there's no checklist and, you know, you see uh, most of the work going to people outside of a community and crime going up, then as a, a representative, a homeowner, you know, just a person who's concerned, you kind of want to see it happen. But thank you for answering my question. Sure. Thank you. Rand Randy Iwasaki, I, I work here at the Contra Costa Transportation Authority. To, to f each type of money has their own rules for, for expenditures. And at the authority, when we use measure money, we have a 7% local business at, uh, deduction. So if you have, a, if you have a, a business located here, a consulting business, for example, if we're using measure money, you get an automatic seven points. And that's a lot of points out of 100 when you're competing. And so there's a lot of the consulting firms have now rented space around this office or out in East County. So Parsons Brinkerhoff has an office, and they've had that office out there in uh, Antioch for, for many years because they helped build Highway 4. So that's a requirement. At a state level, they have small business goals, and then they have disadvantaged veteran business enterprise goals on consulting contracts. The federal level, which we just released a – a, both a federalized uh, construction contract and a federalized construction management contract. Mm -hmm. The construction management contract, it, it came to my desk. It had a 10% disadvantaged business enterprise goal. And so um, I asked Ivan Ramirez, who's our construction manager, what's wrong with this, this contract? And he said, there's nothing wrong with this contract. It's perfect. And I said, but 10%, but that's, he said, that's what Caltrans requires. And I said, I want to go to 25%. This is a very diverse area of California. If we can't get 25% on a construction management contract, something is wrong. So we, we had a pre-construction conference in here, pre-bid conference. I, I reiterated the goal. The, the award, we awarded the contract to Hanna Group, and they, met a, they, met a 20, they got 26% DBE, Disadvantaged Business Enterprise. So the structures company that's going to do the inspection for San Pablo Dam Road interchange on Interstate 80, they're doing 25%, uh, and then they hired a DBE firm to do communications. That's the other 1%. On the construction side, we set the goal at 10%. The, the lowest three bidders all exceeded that 10% goal. So it depends on what kind of money. This 18%, when it goes out to the city, it's the local agency's requirements of whatever they put on, on their contracts to achieve certain requirements, whether it's local hire, as you mentioned, or it's um, other things. But we, we, we ask the cities to do that. We don't want to get in their business on setting their contracts. We have enough problems doing it ourselves. Yeah. Uh, no, I, 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 I want you to be uh, inside of the law. And like you say, different strokes for different folks, I guess. Because yeah, there's different in, rules. In San Francisco, what, what we tried to do, um, or, and, and we were very successful at achieving it, uh, it's, it's 40 percent for the community because I mean for the, for, the, for the city because we feel like if the money is set aside to do things in that area then it should be utilized for the people of that area as well to do that work and I only said that I think I've explained it before some of the things I saw happening uh, in, in that area but thank you and I think I think um, what you just stated is, is, is uh, quite I want to say innovative because I think a lot of a lot of contractors and businesses that come into our community, you know, people don't go in business to lose money. So if I can get in there and do what I got to do, do a good job at doing it, and doing it uh, without involving local hires, I can bring my guys that know how I work, know how I do things. I'm gonna save money on, on that way too. So I understand that, but uh, I, I think that when we've set uh, Forty percent goals. Almost all our contractors either met it or, you know, uh, achieved more than what we asked for. So. We're finding the same thing. By the way, happy holidays to all of you, and thank you for your your volunteerism. We appreciate the work that you do for us. I, I would say we're excited about this. Lindsay Willis is here as well, and on her contract, she sets 
a, a vigorous local hire goal when it's, when it's appropriate on her communications contracts, and we try to hire local. We understand that the measured dollars are generated locally, and we want to spend them locally. We try to do that as much as we possibly can within the requirements set forth by law. And so if we go out in 2016 and try to pass another measure, you know, you don't pass two measures by messing up on the first. You've got to deliver. Promises made, promises kept, and that's what we try to do. And we try to be as transparent as possible, and you help us make sure that we're doing the right thing. So once again, we appreciate your service, so, so thank you for treating Matt with great respect. I appreciate that. <laughs> thank you, Gary. You're welcome. And may I comment, Matt, for the staff, prior to us receiving any kind of compliance checklist, you do review it. If there is an issue, you do contact the particular uh, city. And in some cases, it might be the city engineer or the city planner. It just depends on what their particular budget is for that particular year. And, and uh, emphasize that they need to have a complete packet before they bring it to our group to review. So yeah. thanks. We don't want to waste your time because, you know, that's, you know. And we don't want to be put in a position where we're feeling very uncomfortable by saying we don't approve this. Right. Uh, we know that they're they're counting on the money, and so that's, we want to make sure that, that they are in compliance, but we also don't want to rubber stamp. Right. understand. Any further questions or comments? Do you have your mic live? Say it again. Did you have anything further? You still have your just, mic on. Just the, uh, the the other thing that I would I would say is um, I know that the transportation uh, commission staff come come out to areas uh, to give reports, and uh, I, I won't try to speak for everyone, but I would certainly appreciate. You know, knowing a, knowing a little bit ahead of time, and I'd like to be there to provide, provide any kind of assistance that I can. And I, I want the folks in Antioch, for sure, to understand that they, the person that they asked to do this is, is doing the job, uh, making sure that I can come back and give a comprehensive report. I know what's going on, particularly in our area, since that is where the new portion of BART is going. And uh, just be there to support, you know, my colleagues and the, and the authorities. So thank you very much for taking the time to explain things to me and, and help educate me. And I'd like to thank, you know, my colleagues here for the patience and the things that you asked that I learned from. So thank you. And, and if at any time you guys outside of the meetings have a question, you know, you can email or call staff directly and, and ask us a question. We're, we're totally open to, to, you know, educating you or just answering a question that, you know, you might be hung up on? I have to tell you guys, I worked for three different railroads, hmm. Santa Fe in Chicago, Elgin Joliet in Eastern. Uh, Santa Fe is a crew caller. Um, and here in uh, San Francisco, Southern Pacific Railroad, uh, there's many different places. And uh, uh, I actually worked a lot of vacations because I didn't have a lot of seniority. So I worked at the... Uh, the station on Ford, and uh, I had never been in a room where there are no windows, just tracks on the wall, and it was pretty amazing to me to to learn those things. But this is the other side of what I was doing, you know, as a switchman in Chicago, as you know, the different things. So it's all coming full circle for me. So again, thank you. It's all interconnected. Okay, this is listed as an action item. Are we looking for uh, a recommendation of approval? Well, I've, I've taken down notes based on the, the discussion today, and, and basically we're just asking you to um, concur with the recommendation, and along with your, uh, with your comments, we'll forward this uh, on, we'll circulate it to the, uh, to the cities, and then it will go for approval in January. Okay. Can I have a motion to concur with the recommendation? Second. I have a motion. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? 
Abstentions? Passes unanimously. Okay, the only other thing is uh, I have uh, distributed a report that uh, summarizes what I got out of the last four authority board meetings starting from July on. I'll answer any questions. I'm not looking to, I think, expand on anything. The one big thread that is occupying a good part of each meeting, of course, is the development of the uh, countywide transportation plan and the uh, concurrent transportation expenditure plan. And that's, uh, I think I can state that right now. Of course, Randy is far more up to date than I am. That's proved to be rather a challenging process. Mr. Iwasaki is playing bobblehead back there. <laughs> and, and I wish them luck. Um, yes, certainly. I'm, a, I'm only as good as the uh, November meeting. It, it pays to thank you for asking that question. So we have gone back and, and every four years we're required to update our countywide comprehensive transportation plan. And it was last done in 2009. So 2013 we were supposed to start. We didn't start it until we called it the 2014 comprehensive countywide transportation plan. And as we were going down the process, MTC has changed their guidelines in producing a, a CTP. I'll use that acronym. I, I apologize, Lindsay. She says not to use any, any acronyms. But it's a comprehensive transportation plan for the county, CTP. And so they've changed it. So there's 2,000 guidelines. There's 2014. Because we started before 2014, we were under the old guidelines. We started getting feedback from some of the groups saying, hey, you're not using the new guidelines that MTC has adopted. And we're saying, well, we start early, and we don't need to, to follow those. So we weren't, were going down the path, getting ready to, to develop that, the uh, CTP. And we went out and we did some polling as part of that. And we asked the voters, the eligible voters in Contra Costa, a subset of them, and said, would you, we use ballot language, 75-word ballot language. Would you, would you um, support an extension of the existing measure and adding a half cent? And lo and behold, 68% of the voters came back and said, we'd support that. So it really su it surprised our board. And so they said, well, are you sure that's right? And so can you go out and re-poll? Okay. And let's split sample this time. Let's ask the question, would you support ex extending the existing half-cent sales tax and adding another half-cent? Came back, 68% of the voters said yes. Or would you support a new half-cent sales tax? 65% of the voters said yes. And so we started down the path going, and, and this started because the, the promises made, promises kept mantra that we have, we also have a 25-year and 10 program. So the existing measure is 25 years long. 40% of, of Measure J is for projects, and we're allowed to bond against that future revenue. And so I've been working since I got here five and a half years ago to, to become a triple-A rated agency. We're a we were a double-A plus long-term outlook stable, pretty good credit rating. So in 2012, we went out and we we're on our way to New York City to sell $200 million worth of new money, a new money deal to finance our construction program, mostly out in East County. And Ross Chittenden, the deputy executive director at the time in charge of projects, he's now the chief deputy executive director in charge of projects, he said, hey, Get $225 million. I said, what's the other $25 million for? He said, I don't, I don't know right yet, but I'll tell you later. I got a plan. I said, all right. So <laughs> I went to Wall Street in 2012, double A plus rated a agency, both by Fitch and by Standard & Poor. And we, got, we sold the, interest, the bonds at the lowest interest rate in the history of the bond market, 2.11%. So the future revenue now has more white space, meaning more ability to bond because of, of a lower debt service rating than the one we anticipated based on our, our projection. So we've got more capacity, but we're running out of capacity to build infrastructure that you might need in the future, like 684. So we're concerned about that. So we started taking a look at this process. That's what started the whole thing. And then the update of the countywide transportation plan. 
So we started down the path of, well, would, be, would the voters be really interested in a measure? So we started putting focus groups together. Lindsay has done a great job as part of the outreach. We have gotten more comments using new technology of today. We've got more comments in this last cycle, this cycle that we're underway now, than the last 25 years combined. So we had over 5,000 people on a telephone call, a countywide telephone call, and we answered for an hour people's questions on, on the air live. And so, you know, we're sitting there, and you, know, you really don't know what you're going to get. They'll say, this is a good question about pavement. And so you, take, you say, well, I'm going to hope it's a pavement question. And they'll ask you, hey, how can we have so many potholes? Well, we're trying to deal with that through our 18% of return to source. And we don't want potholes. It causes congestion. So we're, why, don't, why doesn't the bus come right to my doorstep on 4th Street in Pittsburgh or Antioch or Brentwood? Well, we don't have enough money to provide that kind of service. So we're, we're doing all these comments. In the meantime, we're building this transportation expenditure plan. And because they got so close together, we put them together and we coupled those things and they're both under an environmental document. And that's the problem. And so now what's happening is the state has changed the, the law on how you measure congestion. They're saying level of service is no longer valid. Is that correct? No longer valid under CEQA. Under CEQA. And it's, um, is it AB 743? AB 743. So the state, the Office of uh, OPR, Office of Planning and Research, is supposed to deliver guidelines to us on how to deal with that issue. And it's more of a modeler. He's a modeler, so he understands this better than I do. But we're waiting for those guidelines. If the guidelines aren't, aren't out yet, the four subregions in Contra Costa, their action plans that feed into that countywide comprehensive transportation plan use level of service. So we're trying to figure that out. And so now the idea is to decouple and wait for those guidelines to come out from the state. In the meantime, proceed ahead with the transportation expenditure plan. And so that's really where we are today, and, and we're going to take that to the board and let the board decide, should we keep them on schedule, both of them? Should we wait for the state to provide guidelines, how to deal with the AB 743? And uh, stay tuned. It's a, it's a, it just adds to the workload that we had. A Chinese delegation came in two days ago, and we talked to them for an hour about what we do. They found us on the Internet. They, went, they were looking for innovative organizations in California, and for whatever reason, they found us. And so they came to visit us. And I was telling them all the things, and Matt did a great job. He put on five slides. You should see this sometime. It's a great depiction of what we do on the planning side in five slides. And we laid all this out with the projects. And at the end, they said, well, how many people do you have working for you, sir? And I said, 19. You, you people must be Superman. <laughs> I said, no, what we do is we hire consultants. We hire really, really good consultants on, that have offices in Contra Costa, most, most of them. And, and we utilize them as part of staff. And so that's a long-winded kind of way of giving – kind of getting you up to date without leaving a lot, of detail, a lot of the details left out. But that's where we are today. The board will decide hopefully at this next board meeting on Wednesday and next Wednesday, do we concurrently work with them and, and, and try to forge ahead without guidelines or do we split them and wait for the guidelines but forge ahead with the TEP? That's up to our board. So if you split them, then the uh – the TEP would go forward and we would try to uh, come to consensus on the expenditure plan? Yes, and that's a really, it's a very difficult, I have not, uh, I've worked at the state level, but the, 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 the requests for funding, you know, and now I will say 25 year potential measure 2016 generates about $2.3 billion in today's dollars. So in, right now, 20 year, 25 year measure in 2016, we, we figure, figure it's 2,000, 2.3 billion. The bike community says, we want 15%. BART says, we want a billion. The transit agencies say, we want 52%. And then you've got local, local uh, cities saying, we need to deal with our potholes, so we want 30%. When you do the math, it's kind of like when I tell people I'm half Japanese, half Canadian and I'm half Hawaiian, they go, that's 150%. <laughs> this exercise is no different. And so it's really amazing to me, and everybody has needs, but what I think that you should think about and want for our county is if we have a measure that extends for 25 years and we're going to add something new, make it transformational. 
that that's in my opinion I'm not going to be here in, in 20 years but imagine having the ability to leverage future dollars to to fund the next generation of technology not today's technology or yesterday's technology but tomorrow's technology and I think that's what staff at the authority wants to do is they want to build a measure that you will be proud of in 13 14 years and the voters will say wow you guys really figured that out now we have the ability the flexibility to leverage future technology and at the end of the day that's really what you want because as, a, as the economy heats up 680 is going to get worse it's not getting any better so if you use traditional technologies meaning single occupant vehicle you're going to have more people trying to stuff their way down heading to Silicon Valley so part of what we're doing with momentum station is we're trying to bring some of the smart jobs here so that the smart people don't have to drive all over to go to San Francisco Oakland or they can stay in Contra Costa and that's really something that we've been lacking is trying to attract those smart jobs in Antioch and in Concord and, and, and in other places in the meantime we're going to fix state route 4 we're looking at making 680 a technology based corridor using the latest technology to try to make the cars follow closer without hitting each other and as you know part of the congestion problem is people get in accidents and then you you have congestion so we're trying to deal with this along the 680 corridor we're trying to modernize the state route 4 corridor we're trying to extend your transit system we're doing a study for interstate 80 corridor for some kind of transit extension or option as well as interstate 680 so that's a little bit more than you asked for but that's what we're doing Randy since you brought up the the technology which I'm just really excited about um, when you presented the Gomentum station some months ago you mentioned the possibility of uh, arranging um, a field trip or a tour at some point and um, would love to know if that's still uh, a possibility it's getting actually easier now we're, we're um, gonna move the gate so currently the gate to get into the Gomentum station goes through the Army base into the Navy base the Army Army base is um, a th the level has been risen because of some actions against Army bases around the United States so you, you can't you have to be a US citizen to get into that gate otherwise you can't you can't get in it's hard for us because a lot of the autonomous driving experts are not from the United States they're from somewhere else and so we're gonna pay to move the gate Honda's gonna pay to move the gate to another location off Willow Pass once that gate is open Jack will bring all of you in and you can you can actually see Honda testing there'll be a is that can we announce that <laughs> okay we can't announce what I was going to announce so I'm, it's too soon to announce but there may be an opportunity even sooner for that that you might like because you know we, we um, stay tuned yes she's lucky Lindsay was here tonight because I would have probably spilled the beans but yeah we're excited about the, a, fu a future potential possibility that may allow you in there earlier you're welcome well I have a, a question um, I, I heard on the radio driving in this morning that there is a 50 million dollar federal grant for the city in the US that could come up with the best uh, new high-tech infrastructure I, I know this is a county organization but I, I would assume that Concord would try to participate in this there is a size limit I think San Jose was too big and, and that's correct San Francisco and Sacramento are in it where it's, are we at so it's a smart cities initiative announced by Secretary Fox he calls a smart city we call it city 5.0 if you remember 5.0 meaning that you have a a connected city and you overlay a subscription based transportation system autonomous transportation system over it you can reduce greenhouse gases you can improve mobility and you can improve jobs because there's gonna be a lot of tech jobs and that's really what we're trying to trying to get at the requirements if and I only I, I read over it um, at a high level but I think it's about 250,000 people to 800,000 people so we don't have a city that has 250,000 people in it so we might cheat we might combine a couple cities but we are going to make an application yeah and we also the fast uh, fixing America's surface transportation act was just signed by President Obama and increases federal funding that's good news but in there's two tracks that we've been working very hard to get one is freight which along the interstate 80 quarter we made an application with some uh, high-tech partners to create a parking technology to help truckers park in a secure location while they wait to pick up loads 
And so the idea is to work with the Port of Richmond. So we've made that application with the California Air Resources Board at their, at their they have made a call for projects. And so I called a friend of mine who has a truck smart parking company and we've made that application. So we're in that application. That's, that's part of the smart city component, right? Making sure truckers have the right place. Rather than idle in your, in your neighborhood, they can park in location and stop and their load is secure. We're, we're also um, in the FAST Act, there's a innovation title. And that innovation title allows flexibility to go after federal money for autonomous vehicles. And so we're gonna make an application. We're gonna put together a proposal and we're gonna go to DC and we're gonna try to bring some money back. So there's some great opportunities on the technology side as well. So there's a lot of people talking technology, but hopefully we were part of that, that dialogue that helped them write those guidelines. Question. Why not get freight delivered at night? You know, you look at the Bray Bridge, all the bridges. You see, I came down uh, 680 this afternoon. There were seven trucks in a row. And you could, li you could not pass, go from lane one to lane three because this wall of steel was going down the highway. They're trying to get their deliveries made during the daytime. And if you can get deliveries made at night, you can get those trucks out of the way, both on the on the interstate system as well as on the local streets. Get the you have the loading and unloading issues. Uh, it's a huge I know it's a huge labor thing for people to receive goods and so on, but if you can get the trucks out of the way in the daytime, and let the shoppers, business people, and so on use their vehicles, bicycles, cars, buses, whatever, and then at night, say from midnight to 6 a.m. or whatever. You can get your big trucks in and out. Your deliveries made. You could really capitalize on your curb space. That's absolutely correct. And so, I was appointed to the National Freight Advisory Committee by Secretary Ray LaHood at the time, and now it's Secretary um, Fox. And under Fox's watch, I was actually um, promoted to the chair of the committee. And the idea of the committee is to develop a, a strategic plan for freight for the nation for the first time in the history of the United States. And part of that is regulation alignment. And so the real issue is not the truckers, but it's the receivers that only want to receive the goods during the day, which forces the truckers to drive during the day. And so there's a great example of, of regulation alignment. In New Jersey, you can, in Manhattan, you can only go in there at night. That, that's your vision. If, if they're in there and it's daybreak, they got to stay in there and they can't move until it's nightfall again. Kind of like a vampire, right? You can only move around in the dark. <laughs> New Jersey only lets the trucks move during the day because people want to sleep. And so it, they don't align, so they queue up. It's much like the, the Mexican-United States border, same thing. They queue up and they try to get across the border and they're trying to fix that. In the meantime, they're idling. So we're trying to align the regulations so that it provides better shipping opportunities and more capacity on our freeways. And so the... the, the um, Freight Committee has made that recommendation. That's on Secretary Fox's, U.S. Department of Transportation Secretary Fox, on his desk. He needs to sign that bill and then push and make sure those regulations are embedded in law or in regulations so that cities and the receivers can work together to try to bring the freight in at night. But once again, there's going to be more noise at night when you're sleeping. You got trains moving. You got trucks. I mean, I, I agree with you. Or you could have truck only lanes too. That's another option. Is take the inside lane and make a truck only, and allow it between the non-peak hours, and have them run very close using a platooning technology, and they run like a train down a freeway. And then you got the other three lanes, and they never deviate from that one lane until they have to, to move off. There's other ways of dealing with the, the spacing on a freeway. The problem today, in my opinion, is. The trucks are in the right lane, the slow lane. That's where all the weaving occurs. So what you have to do is you have to move the trucks over a lane. Now they beat up the second lane over, however many lanes you have. And then now there's, but you've got to weave around those trucks. If they stayed in one lane and you didn't have to weave around them, you'd, you'd have a lot less congestion. But the, when I worked for Caltrans, we didn't build a fast lane for trucks. But today, the thinking may change, and they say, get those trucks in the middle, Make them go the same speed, follow real close using connected vehicle technology, and then you can have the other three lanes and do whatever. So there's a lot of, there's, but point is there's a strategic plan that they're working on at a national level 
to try to deal with exactly your issue. You're welcome. Thank you for letting me go to Washington every now and then to participate. Thank you. Randy, uh, one of my pet um, topics is always the bus service and or a lack of it. So I'm just wondering what kind of uh, focus are we doing that um, as we see a more and more increase in the population and, and getting the cars off the road because – if I can't get there on public transportation, I am going to take the car and, you know, connect the dots. You continue to – we continue to improve our area and we build and we have affordable housing and we build. And all of that is a good thing. Um, but it shouldn't be a surprise to any of us that what comes out of that is traffic on the road. So if we're not addressing the issue of – Say, for instance, I, I take BART to Antioch when that opens, and then the businesses are in different parks. If I can't get there, I'm driving. What do we – I mean, where's our focus on, on public transportation? Did, did you call in on one of those town halls? No, I didn't. <laughs> I thought I heard the same no, question. No, that was my ugly stepsister. <laughs> All right, so here's, here's the answer. Matt has done a great job. Matt was part of a team that took a look at a, a study that was done a few years ago, and they've dusted it off on Interstate 680 looking for the various options to do exactly what you're talking about, is provide more mobility through that Interstate 680 corridor. In addition, we have signed the exclusive agreement for North America to bring a self-driving vehicle to the United States or to North America. It's called the – it's made by Easy Mile. And uh, the vehicle is the, the, what they call each individual one's EZ-10. And it's a self-driving vehicle. It's seat six, so three people facing each other, and you stand much like in BART. Pardon? Yeah, yes. It's seat six, and it stands six. So it has 12, right? Yeah. So 12 people. And then these things will go on a route, and they got sensors. They won't hit anything. And so the idea, we're going to test the, the two vehicles out at uh, Gomentum Station, get them ready to go. And the problem today with autonomous vehicle legislation, and we like the legislation, but the problem is it, 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 you, it's required to have a steering wheel. It requires the vehicle to have a steering wheel. So by, by nature, if you have a self-driving vehicle, why do you need a steering wheel? It takes space up. And this is what I mentioned a long time ago. I said, you think of a car, if we're all sitting four, you know, looking straight ahead two by two. It could be all of us looking at each other playing a Scrabble game in the future. And now it's not thinking that doesn't sound so crazy. But these vehicles drive themselves, and so we're going to need help. And Assembly Member Bonilla is, is willing to help us propose legislation on a pilot basis to test it on the city streets at Bishop Ranch. Right there. Okay, so the problem there now is getting so crowded you can't find a parking space, That's right? Perfect. And so you want to go from one place to the other. We want you to stay somewhere else and we'll bring you in or we'll feed you to BART. And so – if, ask Matt to come to you and update you on this I-680 plant, and he'll add the, go, this, this easy mile kind of thing, and we'll show you how it's going to work out at east part of Contra Costa, and we'll show you how we have an idea for Moraga, Arinda, and Lafayette. Coming off those hills, bringing them down, because there's no bus service to get you, so you have to drive, and that's your question about parking. There's got all this valuable land, but it's all flat. Why? Because people won't vote yes on going up. But there might be another option. So have Matt – sorry, volunteer. <laughs> we're, we're presenting to the board next week, so we're, we'll yeah. have a presentation. Well, that, that's a great segue to the last part of the uh, – I'm sorry. One more, one okay. more comment. Thank you. It, it wasn't just BART. It's, you know, it can also be Amtrak. And just so BART just came to my mind. But we also need to remember that we have people commuting on Amtrak who come here and get – and we'll disembark at Oakland, disembark in Martinez, and so getting them from the Amtrak station to the particular business, um, you know, that's one consideration too. In Oakley, we're trying to make sure that the, the future Amtrak station, if that's the, what the public wants, make sure that it's close so you don't have to walk two miles to, to make cross-platform. So we just want you to cross-platform and we'll have an ability to shuttle you to where you need to go. 
And the Brentwood is the same thing. You're going to, Brentwood Station may be built before BART's extended out there, if BART's ever extended out there, correct? Yeah. But you have to have an intermodal center. And so that's what you're looking for in Brentwood, and that's what we supported. Yeah, that's that's what we're looking at right now. So park and ride, probably a new uh, hub for uh, Tri Delta Transit. Exactly. Things like that. Steve, Steve, can I make a quick comment? Sure. I just want to thank you and your staff, Randy. I mean, it's great to hear future dollars being spent on the future. You know what I mean? Like yes, it, versus I do. borrowing against all this money, and bringing it back to present to get everything up to par, and start thinking about the flexibility component to a lot of these projects. So. Thank you, Not from at least from Pinole, and I think I can speak for my colleagues. It's it's great to hear. Okay, so we're in the last section, the uh, path, uh, future agenda items. Uh, I have uh, I have certainly the one that's been discussed would be a good one when that is uh, ripe for presentation. Another one I think we might be interested in would be you know the first X months experience with the uh, I-80 ICM experience after you've had that going a while and what you're seeing happen with that. Any other suggestions? I would like to for us to uh, consider the uh, CAC roles and responsibilities. A refresher? Yes. And also in that if you would have a, a template of the compliance checklist and just go through it as uh, an ideal checklist would look like for us. And I'd like to see uh, uh, your description uh, or presentation on how this uh, Easy Mile uh, program would be set up. Sure. Maybe we can combine that with the 680 transit study. You want to a tap update? I can, see, give, I can give Ross to come here and give you a tap update if you want. See what happens when you show up? I love it. <laughs> well, actually, you know, the members of this group are probably some of the most engaged non-CCA staff members or authority board members on transportation in the county. And we will do our best to not skip several months in a row like we did the last few. We, we, we have a lot of items to share with you over the next several months, so try and be more, uh, more routine with our scheduling. Anything further? In which case, we'll go ahead and adjourn till January the 27th. Merry Christmas, everybody. Merry Christmas. Or whatever variation thereof. <laughs> <laughs>